We have the end of the Ottoman Empire and the making of the modern Middle East. And what I've entitled this one is the post-war settlement. Uh, actually, post-war in this case, I'm going to try to cover an entire century from uh, the end of World War I until 2021. That's a big jump, but we'll see what happens. Uh, last week, we talked about World War I. And if you look at that map, you see these green areas are what were called the central powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. And generally when you read about the First World War, uh, they're always talking about trench warfare in France, which was a horrible experience, but it's also the, a function of, we read the books in English. There are other things going on that we'll see. And one of the things we, we talked about last week was Turkey was convinced by Germany to join the central powers. And that was in 1915, they entered the war. And we have this infamous attempt at the invasion of Gallipoli. You see it down here on the map where the British and the French plus others tried to invade Turkey, the idea was to go up through Constantinople, Istanbul, and uh, link up with the Russians who were part of the allied forces. It was a, a real screw up on both sides. It was just a slaughter on both ends. And as you remember, we talked about uh, Australia and New Zealand still remember this as a day of remembrance, Anzac Day, because so many of their young people were slaughtered. The other thing that we talked about was the tragedy of the Armenians, that the Turkish or Ottoman government attempted, said, almost by definition said, if you're Armenian, you're a traitor. You have to be rounded up. And we looked at this novel, which is based on what we know about what happened 40 days of Musabag. Uh, I, if you're interested, I urge you to look at it. It's only about 800 pages. Uh, you can also look on YouTube. There is a movie and we showed a few excerpts from it. Once again, it's a movie, so they're recreating things, but it certainly seems to jive with what we know. So here we are at the end of the war and here's Turkey. You know, all of a sudden the Turkey as we know it. Remember this is called Asia Minor right here. And we're going to, just to remind you, the Armenians are out here in the eastern areas. And there's the border with the modern day Armenia. And we will see in a few minutes, there are a lot of Greeks living here in, all along the, uh, North, the Black Sea coast and the Aegean coast. It's got a very large Greek population. In fact, as far as I understand, the majority of the population in Turkey <clears throat> at the end of the war was Christian, not Muslim. Uh, it's something we have to think about. But anyway, you can try to think about these uh, areas. Here is, uh, down here is the current uh, capital. Uh, it's not marked on here. Ankara is right down here in the mountains. And uh, Izmir, we will say something about Izmir in just a minute because it's really important. At the end of the war, we have the legacies of imperialism. Harry talked about imperialism in South Africa. He talked about imperialism in India and he's gonna talk about China. We also have the Middle East. And I give you the, the, uh, some of the major figures in the peace conference of Versailles at the end of the war. Georges Clemenceau, who's the French prime minister, David Lord George, David Lord, Lloyd George, a Bible spelling Welshman who was very important, and Woodrow Wilson, uh, a master of the cliche, personal comment, uh, remember, he had his 14 points 
that was supposed to bring about peace in Europe and the world. Uh, actually, the only country who got mentioned in that 14 points was Poland uh, as a specific country. And we talked about that in the course I did last year, so I'm not going to review that. But these are just interesting pictures of these people. And what was happening is that the countries were arguing over the spoils. They weren't ready to say, oh, we just had World War I, or whatever you want to call it, uh, and everything is going to be hunky-dory. There'll be independent people. Instead, here you have, look at the Middle East here, and these are the, the uh, imperial powers who are making claims or had claims. You can take France, which had been in Algeria since 1830, and was now very interested in taking over Syria. You have the British who are all over the place, Egypt, uh, Sudan, what's now called Sudan and South Sudan, uh, Aden, the, the, the uh, Trucial, what are called the Trucial states here, uh, Persia, now, now Iran, and this is a flag of Turkey here. Uh, so what we're seeing uh, in this particular map, this green stuff, is before the war is over, that's the Ottoman Empire. You know, it's the it's sort of desert in here, nothing's going on. What's important though, here we have Mecca. Uh, it's really important for Muslims who controls Mecca and uh, what's called the Sheriff Hussein is controls, at least for the time being, Mecca, not the people who eventually took over Saudi Arabia. Uh, and this is where we get the legend of, the, of Lawrence of Arabia, who Lawrence goes down here and tries to create an army. But uh, don't forget, we also have other countries. We have the British, I'm sorry, the Italians. The Italians had invaded Libya. Uh, they invaded the <coughs> Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia down here, they were trying to invade the Ottoman Empire too. And in fact, these little islands right here, the Dodecanese Islands, that remained Italian until 1947. And oh, Spanish, you know, they still have these two towns here, Teuta and Melilla, right here. They're still there in 2021. There's still an issue of the uh, Spain controlling uh, little bits of North Africa. And then finally, in Russia, which was really interested until the 1917 revolution. And we don't, there we go. You have these images. The British, had, after the war, they were anti German, and they were in the, in the uh, propaganda, that was a Jew, that was a Bolshevik. And there's this rabid anti-Bolshevism that takes over British foreign policy. Uh, and it combines with British imperialism. They want to control Egypt. Well, they did control Egypt, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, Arabia. But at the same time, there was a tremendous desire to demobilize their army. They didn't have enough soldiers to do all the things that they wanted to do. Uh, so they talked a lot, but they had some issues in control. You have a conflict between Britain and France here in, in uh, Syria. Right here is where we get Lebanon being formed, right on the coast, and Palestine, which is here. Look at uh, Jerusalem is uh, in, uh, now capital of Israel, but in Palestine, it's right here. And where it says Amman, that's what is now Jordan. And we'll see where that comes about. The League of Nations set up something called the mandate system. And these different countries got a mandate that is they're gonna take over the government and they're gonna train the people for independence. So you have a mandate in Iraq, in Saudi Arabia, in Syria, uh, in various places. Uh, it's interesting that there was a proposal that the Americans should have a mandate of over Armenia. Uh, and we stayed out of that one, luckily. We then have 
this thing called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Let's go on. I have another map of that. We'll come back. We have these are arrangements for the imperial powers to hold on to what they're having. Sykes-Picot, that's a, a British and a French statesman, met together and divided up the Middle East. In the meantime, Sheriff Hussein in Mecca and McMahon, who's the British uh, administrator in Egypt, have letters which are in conflict with the other. And we'll see what the conflict is. And the French have this continuing mission civilisatrice. The idea is that it's French culture and civilization. Uh, of course, trading and economy are very important to them, but they don't talk about that. And then, as I said, we have the mandate system of the League of Nations. There is a settlement in 1922. Remember, we always talk about the Treaty of Versailles, but there were many treaties at the end of the war, four or five, uh, and Versailles doesn't deal with the Middle East. But I just wanted to point out here, the high point of imperialism, which starts, you know, we have Columbus, Congress of the New World, the British East Indies and the Empire of India, that's what Harry talked about, and Harry's going to talk about, I think, the Opium War later. France tries to take over, does take over into China, and that's the, uh, the core of our war in Vietnam. We followed the French. So, you know, lots of things in the 20th and 21st century come out of this area. And then in the 19th century, the Europeans divvied up Africa. Uh, I won't go into detail on that one. Uh, that's for an, a future course. In the dawn of the 20th century, we have the Middle East. That After the, the European powers took up Africa at the end of the 19th century, in the early 20th century, they won the Middle East. Uh, it's economics, it's pride, it's arrogance, you know, it's a combination of the notion of Christian civilization plus really good trading privileges. And Lloyd George was like to say his army, according to him, his armies are the ones that controlled the middle, brought about the conquest of the Middle East. So here's the Middle East in 1920. And if you look at the red stuff, uh, let's see if we have, a, you have British, British forces everywhere, Egypt, Mesopotamia, which is now Iraq, Palestine and Jordan, uh, Cyprus initially, the Trucial States, Qatar, Bahrain, these, all these names should be familiar to you from headlines if you look at international news. It's, uh, this is where we get our modern Middle East. And here, I wrote this here. Don't look backwards in World War II. In 1922, Britain seemed on top of the world. They were about to fall off, but they didn't know it. Uh, but in 1922, it really seemed like the high tide of the European imperial powers. Uh, one exception here, uh, Persia, more or less independent. And what emerged from the Ottoman Empire? Look at what we have. These are countries that didn't exist before. Turkey, as we now know it. Egypt became independent. Algeria was still a, well, that's a big issue, Algeria. It's not an independent country. Armenia, which is, remember, right over here, right on the border of uh, Turkey and Iran. Here's Cyprus, this island here. Cyprus is still a flashpoint. You know, we have a, you know, Turks and Greeks are still fighting it out. We have Syria. We know about the civil war in Syria now. In Lebanon, we have Hezbollah versus the government. We have Jordan, or what was originally called Transjordan. Palestine, which became Israel. And well, you see this yellow thing? That's the West Bank. The Israelis. More or, have more or less annexed it, although they don't call it that, but the Palestinians still do not accept that. Iraq, here it is, Mesopotamia. You know, we when we went to school, the, 
the cradle of civilization was Iraq and, and, and Egypt, but Iraq is, you know, Tigris, Euphrates, Valley. Uh, and look at that, Kuwait. We had a war in Kuwait, 1991. In the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have Yemen, civil war still going on. United Arab Emirates are peaceful, but very wealthy. And there's a dispute, are they, whom are they supporting? Are they supporting the conservative Saudis or are they supporting ISIS or other uh, Islamic revolutionary groups? Bahrain, Qatar, you know, uh, if you're like me, you see these names in the paper, you're not quite sure where they are until you search them out on the map. But, you know, we, this is the end of World War I, and these things have emerged onto the front pages. One of the horrible results of the war was the, the, the uh, Greco-Turkish War of 1921 and 22. You have Prime Minister Venizelos, if you remember, I talked about him last year, his very grandiose notions of a greater Greece. Uh, and it went way into Anatolia, into what's now Turkey. On the other hand, you have the emergence in Turkey of Mustafa Kemal, uh, whom later is called Ataturk, the father of his country. He's the hero of Gallipoli. I gave you a quote last week where he says to the soldiers, I didn't call for you to defend the fatherland. I call on you to die for the fatherland. So what happens in, in uh, let's see if we got a, no, no, let's get that map. Uh, a little confusing, but what's important to me to show is, look, here's modern Greece and here's Turkey. This yellow stuff tells you where Greeks are living. So it's not just a matter of Greece on one side and Turkey on the other. This is popula Greek population. And this is the context in which the Greeks invade Anatolia. At the end of the war, the uh, British sort of encouraged the Greeks to go take what quote belongs to them. Remember the old Byzantine Empire goes back, you know, 2000 years to the Roman Empire. And the Greeks feel they're entitled to this here. So what happens is they invade uh, uh, Smyrna. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for it on the map. It's in here somewhere. And what they immediately have terrific successes. They overrun the, the Greeks. There are some cases of uh, rape, murder, not as widespread, but as, as, as the Turks claim, but as in any kind of war, the horrible events take precedence in people's minds. We'll see that in other places too. So it's the Greek army versus the Turkish army. And Lord George talks about the Turks as that marauding herd and Prime Minister Venizelos is one of the greatest statesmen. On the other hand, uh, it's really uh, it's delusions of grandeur. What happens is the Turks march in, I mean, I'm sorry, the Greeks march in, a lot of damage, but their supply lines run out. They're not really prepared for this. The man who becomes Ataturk rallies the Turkish army and they drive the Greeks back. Uh, it, it's really, you know, people with scorched earth, one side burns down villages, burns down fields so that the conquering army won't be able to use any of this stuff there. And the result is what is what's called a quote population exchange. That is half a million Greeks from Smyrna and from up here, the, the Pontic Greeks are expelled. Uh, and up to I have a million and a half, I'm not sure, but a large number of Turks are expelled from, from Greece, you know, since these were one country initially. The, the Turk himself was born in uh, Thessalonica, which is, you know, the Greek port over here. So 
it's not just, you know, it's not a population exchange where you get uh, people getting on trains and going to the other area. It's murder in many cases. If some of you have seen pictures of the uh, Pakistani Indian population exchange in 47, the same thing happened here. You know, people put on boats, thrown overboard, just horrible things happened. Uh, this is, you know, the culmination of those uh, nationalist claims at the end of the First World War. The Treaty of Lausanne in 1923 set the Middle East almost as we know it today in terms of the borders. The big, the big exception is Palestine and Israel. What they did in this treaty, they declared amnesty for crimes in this 10 year period. Amnesty for the Turks against the Armenians, for the Greeks versus the Turks, the Turks versus the Greeks, the Assyrians who are uh, Christians who were slaughtered, not in as great numbers as the Armenians, but they suffered greatly during the war. And what you have is an exchange of populations. Today we call it ethnic cleansing. Then they call it exchange of populations. It happened after World War I and it happened after World War II. So in the Middle East, except for Palestine and Israel, this is where we are. Eastern Anatolia becomes Turkish, no Armenians. Turkey becomes independent and it cl they claim they will have protection for the Orthodox in Turkey and the Muslims in Greece, although there are not many people left. And here is Ataturk himself known as father, that's what the word means, father of his country. Uh, I'm told that's what it means in Turkish. Maybe we have a few residents here who know some Turkish. They can tell me if that's incorrect. Turkey accepted the loss of Cyprus. Uh, although it's, it, we'll see in the 1970s, they weren't permanently accepting the loss. Turkey ceded its claims on the Dodecanese Islands. I pointed them out to you. It's claims on Cyprus, it's claims on Egypt, Sudan, Syria, Iraq. That is, Turkey recedes to what we now call Turkey. Uh, and here is a celebration of Turkish nationalism, Ataturk Day. You know, you can see that in other countries, but this is an example of Turkey here. The new Turkey. Now, what's going to happen in this course, I can't possibly deal with uh, all these countries individually, but I thought that people would be interested in seeing what would happen in some of these areas. So in each of the next four classes, we're going to talk about individual countries. And the first one I want to say something about <clears throat> is Turkey. And Turk takes care of the abolition of the Sultanate. That's the uh, end of the, uh, the old regime. Uh, and, you know, Ataturk becomes, uh, dictator is a funny word. I'm not quite sure whether he can just snap his fingers, but he was the father of his country. We now have a country which is 98% Muslim, 85% Turkish mother tongue. So, uh, that's, you know, a, a unifying factor. It's interesting, by the way, that they, uh, when they came in, they had Ottoman Turkish, which was a sort of old style language, was an official language that a lot of people did not really understand or couldn't write. It's very similar to uh, the kind of old style Greek until the uh, uh, 1870s and 80s. But what Ataturk introduces is a kind of secular government a lay government to take the church or the church, the mosque out of uh, politics. It does other things such as 1928, they switch from an Arabic alphabet to a Latin alphabet, uh, which be, you know, a lot of people have to relearn that, not so easy. You have <clears throat> an urbanized population, 
industrial to the point where today Turkey is really a, uh, an industrial power. You begin to have a, uh, a court system, which is a national court system. Last time we talked about the millet system, where it's each, in this case, religious community had its own system of courts. Well, that's not what we call a modern state. The Ottoman Turkish was revised with the alphabet, as I mentioned. And look at this. It's, a pro it's something that happens all over the Middle East. In 1927, 13.6 million people. By 1950, it uh, increases probably by 75%. 1986 is up to 52 million. And in 2021, there are 85 million people. This is a very big country. And have a lot of problems when that happens. Uh, housing, education, health. In addition, you have a sometime democratic country which is rocked by a series of military coups. Uh, if you look through history books of the 20th century after 1950, every so often there's another Turkish government run by the military. Uh, and the most recent one <clears throat> was in 2016. If you watch the papers about Turkey, you'll see that the uh, uh, repression of what people who are considered uh, revolutionaries is still going on in Turkey. So here's <clears throat> just a, a graph of that population growth. 85 million people. But look at the population pyramid. Ordinarily, you know, it goes by age, the youngest all the way up to, in this case, age 80. Ordinarily, in most pyramids, this area here, the middle age, it's the middle age bulge. But uh, Turkey is suffering a problem here. Uh, and it's not unlike other countries in Western Europe. It's not getting enough younger people to replace the older people. It suggests future problems. But in foreign policy, it's allied with the West. The Turkish forces in the Korean War, Turkey joined NATO, and there's, you're probably aware, there are a lot of tensions now in NATO. Turkey has recently purchased uh, Russian military equipment, which has caused NATO to uh, put a halt on sharing its equipment. It's afraid of the Russians picking up what the NATO is using, their secrets. You have what in Germany are called Gastarbeiter, guest workers. It's a euphemism. These are people who moved to Germany for work. Germany provided lots of uh, employment opportunities. And there are a large number of Turks in Germany uh, who are now German citizens. I mean, Germany has become in many senses a multi-ethnic country, although they don't, the Germans don't like to admit that. But you see Turks in parliament, Turks in, uh, well, well, Turks, Turkish names. So much so that at the last Turkish election, they did, uh, they worked on the election in Germany trying to get voters. Now, what you get though with President Erdogan is a renewal of nationalist feeling. I mean, and he, he plays on Muslim consciousness. Uh, for example, one of the things that tourists are upset about, I'm not sure if the Muslims are, Hagia Sophia, this famous, famous mosque, which had originally been a church, was a museum for a long time and now has been reconverted to a mosque. You have in 2021, a renewed conflict over Cyprus. You know, Cyprus is, has been divided into uh, Republic of Cyprus and Turkish Republic of Cyprus. The Turkish Republic is recognized only by Turkey. On the other hand, the Turkish army has controlled it and uh, things have heated up again. We now have, have uh, Turkish Greek conflicts over international waters. So it's not so quiet there. One of the problems that I did want to point out is one of the reasons, ways that Turkey has grown is 
through loans, foreign loans. And they've gone on an enormous building program, very successful one. There comes a time, however, when you have to repay your loans. And if you think of Greece now, which is really couldn't pay its loans and it's under a lot of control by the European Union or the International Monetary Fund, it's reminiscent of what we call the capitulations. If you return, remember that term, capitulations were a series of concessions in the Ottoman Empire that allowed foreign countries to do things like the Italians controlled the banks, uh, other people controlled the railroads and so on. Uh, I think it's possible that Erdogan and Turkey are heading into trouble because he continues to have grandiose construction schemes. Here's an example. The latest thing, just in the papers recently, he wants to build a canal that will parallel the, the, uh, the movement of the Straits from the Black Sea to the Dardanelles. This will be a major, major undertaking, costing tens of billions of dollars. Uh, and nobody knows whether it's technologically possible or financially possible. And if it is possible, if anybody would use it, since it's going to be charged for use as opposed to a free passage for, for ships. Uh, Turkey is a question. You know, it's no question that Turkey is today a major international power. It's involved in Syria. It's involved, well, let's see what else we got. What's what I call the empire strikes back. Remember, I'll come back to Turkey in a second. This was a picture we saw in the first class of the Ottoman Empire. Look at this thing. Here's, you know, here's what we call Turkey here, but way over here into what's now Iraq, uh, Syria, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, uh, what is that? Libya, Algeria. This is Greece. Today, where is Turkey involved in foreign policy? And I'm calling the, the empire strikes back. At home, it's pursuing the plotters of 2016. If you recall, there is a, a, a cleric, conservative cleric living in Pennsylvania, whom Erdogan accuses of having been behind the 2016 coup, attempted coup, and he keeps calling for the extradition. He's on a campaign against Kurdish nationalists. All of a sudden, Kurds have become his target. Actually, they've become our heroes in, uh, in, uh, in the newspapers. During the First World War, they were involved in this assassination of the Armenians. Now, all of a sudden, they're the targets. But anyway, they live, here's an Eastern Turkey, uh, Iran, Iraq, this is all what some people call Kurdistan. And the Kurds have been very successful to a point, uh, so successful that Turkey has now really engaged in a strong military campaign against Kurdish nationalists. So if you read the papers, you know, there are heroes and all of a sudden uh, they're, they're good guys. Remember that no nationalist movement is completely good or completely bad. But look at these other areas that uh, Turkey is involved in. First of all, they deny the Armenian massacres. You may be aware that that's a real sticky point. And the, and the uh, Turks are really very concerned about any criticism. In fact, uh, just last week, uh, 10 countries, who, whose uh, government had criticized some Turkish uh, repression of people were asked to recall their ambassadors, including the United States, and then other Western European countries. 
They deny the Armenian massacres. They restrict the press. And there's a renewed emphasis on Islam. You have these grandiose building projects, which I mentioned. Abroad, we have in Azerbaijan, which is over here. Uh, remember, if you recall, there was just in 2020, 2021, a renewal of a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And the Azeris had what seems to be a pretty definitive victory. And a lot of it was with uh, uh, Turkish arms. In Iraq, they're attempting to cut off water to the Kurds. I mean, it's really, there's a drought and they're cutting off water. It's a very difficult situation for Kurds up in here. Uh, Mosul and Kirkuk, these are cities whose names you may see in the paper. In why the Turks are involved in Somalia? It's, yeah, I don't know, it's the uh, notion of Turkish influence, but they are supporting certain revolutionary groups down here in Somalia. They're involved in the Libyan, and Libya is over here in this white space next to Egypt. In the Libyan civil war, you know, there are all these warlords running around. Some of them have Turkish and Russian support. Uh, in Morocco, they are, the Turks support some groups that are anti-government. In Cyprus, right here, there is the conflict with, the, with Greek Cyprus. In Greece, there's, you know, over waters here. Here's, uh, here's Istanbul. Here is the area that had been the uh, war area in 1921-22. Uh, here are the Dodecanese Islands right along here. And here are the conflicts with Greece. Oops, let's go back for a second. Uh, you know, this is not, I can't give you a great course in all of Turkey, but I thought these are things that would interest people. I can uh, stop for a minute if you have questions. Uh, uh, we have two comments, which I will read to you. Uh, one is uh, climate change destroying Iraq. Yes, we talked about controlling the water. The other, Hava says, the Kurds have been persecuted, if that's the word, by the Turks for many decades. See the film Yol. Uh, once again, I point out, Kurds have been persecuted. Kurds are not in every case the good guys. They can be the bad guys, they can be the good guys. They are weaker and are being persecuted. Now, do we have, if you have a question, unmute yourself before we go on. I could just say that the Tur the Kurds not having had their own state in their cultural in their in their ethnic area have been a you know as as I think many people are aware they've been an ethnic minority in Turkey they've been an ethnic minority in Iran um, they uh, have had difficult times in both places which is not to say and in Iraq I mean and this is not to say that they are uh innocent of uh, of crimes themselves uh but um uh they have been it's been feared in in all the places that they've been that they will go out on separatist uh try to break away from these countries which indeed they wish to do uh and that has been the foundation of the uh of the of the persecution of them uh, if, again, if that's the word. Yol is a very interesting and powerful film made in Turkey about, uh, it's about a Turkish, uh, about a Kurdish uh, prisoner who goes home on holiday. They actually gave them furloughs from prison, but anyway, okay. Hey, thank you for that. Uh, as I, as uh, Chava did not throw in that they like to use the term Kurdistan for this area up here in Northern Iraq, uh, a little bit of Iran, Eastern Turkey. Uh, and we'll see. I mean, it's a, it's an issue still playing out. I'd like to move on because 
it's uh, I just don't have time to do all this. And it's something that I call the Zionist project. That is, when I mentioned we're going to do uh, various countries, I like to at least have an introduction to Israel or what was called the Zionist project. And this is uh, with some of the heroes, Chaim Weizmann, who was a, uh, a scientist in Britain who became a great spokesman for the Zionist movement, became the first president of Israel. Uh, David Ben-Gurion, who became prime minister, who sort of took over from Weizmann. Golda Meir, the American who became Israeli prime minister. And Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who probably, I mean, he was anti-Semitic, but his whole, uh, he allied with the, the Nazis because that's where he saw power coming from. He didn't bother him what the uh, uh, Nazi racial program was. These are just some pictures of people who are involved in what was going on in the 1920s. Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir go all the way to the 1960s and 70s. So we have what I we have Zion, the movement of Zionism. We have Palestine. What becomes Israel becomes Transjordan and Jordan. Uh, these uh, let's take a look at these things. In 1917, you have what's called the Balfour Declaration. Lord Balfour is the uh, I forgot its title, Interior Secretary. I think he was uh, Foreign Secretary. I'm sorry. And he sends this letter, this is from the newspaper, he sends this letter to Lord Rothschild in regard to the establishment of a national home. And I'd like to read this because it gets quoted so often. I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. And here's the statement. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It, be clearly, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I, would, I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Well, this is published in 1917, May of 1917. Now, what was happening in 1917? World War One is still being fought. As far as the British are concerned, on the Western Front, it's a stalemate. It's a terrible situation. The British had invaded Mesopotamia, uh, and after some real defeats, they were beginning to have some success. But it wasn't clear that Germany was going to be defeated, that the Ottoman Empire was going to be defeated. They are interested in developing support around the world. 1917, and there is this, you know, there's a, there's a partial, ironic, I think, anti-Semitic notion to this Balfour Declaration. The notion that the Jews are an international power. And by giving them this, they're going to get that power. You know, who was, Lord, who was Balfour? He was the foreign secretary. Who was Lord Rothschild? He's the uh, uh, head of, I don't know what his title was but he's a communal leader, a head of a federation in Great Britain. And Chaim Weizmann is involved in the Zionist organization. Weizmann was a scientist who developed uh, something in Manchester, which was very useful the, for the British army. So he had a lot of prestige. On the other hand, oh, uh, David Lord George, is a real Bible thumper. He sees the redemption, the rapture, whatever you want to call it, uh, of the return of the Jews to the Holy Land. On the other hand, there were some Jewish communal leaders, uh, uh, wealthy leaders who were very upset by this because this 
in their eyes, brings into question their patriotism. You know, they would be interested in another country, not in Great Britain. So they were, leaders were upset with this. They were repudiated by their constituents. But this reaction does show splits in the community. It's mirrored in the United States as well, but not as strongly as in Britain, I would think. There was, as I say, this vaunted power of world Jewry. This is an old uh, charge. Remember, there is this book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which becomes very widespread after 1900, uh, which shows supposedly are the minutes of the elders of Zion and how they're taking over the world. Uh, and that same thing is still reprinted in places. But the British had this obsessive desire to win the friendship of the Jewish communities in Russia and America. First of all, you know, in America, there was certainly a, a Jewish community that had some connection to the banking circles. The idea of winning the Jewish communities in Russia is laughable to me uh, because they're, you know, they are oppressed by the Russian government. They are considered potential traitors and, you know, they are, they are expelled from areas along the border with Germany. Uh, they are, uh, before the war, they were leaving the country and millions of people. So to think that the Balfour Declaration would appeal to to them to support the Russian government is odd. On the other hand, there was a revolution in Russia in uh, February or March, depending what calendar you use, where you have this attempt at a democratic government, but Russia is really not peaceful. You know, they're on the verge of a civil war, which uh, eventually becomes the uh, revolution of, of November 1917 and a civil war, which lasts for several years. Uh, Jews suffer very much. The Zionist proclamation didn't help them there. Well, in the Middle East, the legacy of imperialism, we have what I mentioned earlier, this Sykes-Picot agreement. Sykes, the British diplomat, and Picot, the French, draw up this map. Look at this thing. They, this is 1916, when they're not sure who's going to win the war. They're ready to divide up the whole Middle East. We have, you know, here's the, the blue zone. This is uh, Southern Turkey and Northern Syria. This uh, purple zone, French influence, you know, how they distinguish between control and influences, they have to work on it. And you have this area, which later becomes Lebanon, French control. Then the British get this stuff, what here becomes uh, Jordan and Transjordan, and all this stuff out to, into Arabia, that's British influence. British control, Iraq, because they had begun to discover oil here. No oil yet in Arabia, but they knew about oil here. And how do you deal with Palestine? Well, we'll do it together. The two of us will control the country. That's Sykes-Picot. On the other hand, you have what are called the Hussein McMahon letters. Uh, Hussein, who is a local chieftain with control over Mecca, and McMahon, the administrator in Egypt. McMahon says, Britain is prepared to recognize and support the independence of the Arabs in all the regions within the limits demanded by the Sharif, that's Hussein. And that includes, as you see, Syria, Arabia, Mesopotamia with the exception of those portions of Syria lying to the west of the districts of Damascus, Homs, Hama, and Aleppo. And the reason for that exception is because <clears throat> they're recognizing the French desire for influence. Uh, some of this in the, uh, in retrospect, is, is hard to figure out what, the, what they wanted with all this control, but they did want it. And remember, in both cases, the context is war against the Ottoman Empire. If you think back to Lawrence of Arabia, what was he doing? Well, he's trying to uh, rally the Turkish troops against the Ottoman Empire. In Palestine, 1922, 1948, first of all, 
1917, the British army conquers Palestine. We have to remember this is the first time since the Crusades that there is uh, a Western ruler, if you will. And here's a picture of Allenby entering Jerusalem on foot. It's still considered the holy city. Uh, and he's seen as a, certainly as a savior by Zionists who are there, although he himself is probably an anti-Semite. But this is the first Christian conquest of Jerusalem since the Crusades. And we begin to get, after the war, British rule over the mandate. Remember I said the mandate system under the League of Nations is how these countries get control. And they create initially Transjordan. It wasn't clear what Palestine was. So Transjordan meaning across the Jordan River. Uh, and we see, I, I just threw this in here. That's a current picture. But Jerusalem is, as you probably know, is still in contention. There's uh, the wailing, what's called the Wailing Wall, the old wall, the temple from the Bible, and the Mosque of Omar, holy for the Muslims right there next door. Palestine sees very strong immigration, Eastern European immigration starting in the 1880s, but it becomes really big after 1900. And certainly a lot of the spokesmen have a socialist mentality. There is Arab protest, but it, it doesn't seem to fit in with uh, exactly when the Jews are coming. And the other problem that the Arab community has is it's based on leading families. And these families tend to be in conflict with one another. The Zionists are much more, quote, modern. They have a broader political organization. Uh, they form under British auspices something called the Jewish Agency. Uh, and it's, to me, remarkable how successful they were at organizing. And by 1936, they be, they're 30 percent of the population. Well, 30% is a big number for the Zionists. It still means that they're a minority in the country and the, uh, Palestinian, the word Palestinian isn't used yet, but the local Arabs who are a certain number of Christians as well as Muslims are upset. How did the Zionists get all the land? They essentially bought it. And it, that's another conflict within the Arab community. You have these leading families who are opposed to Zionists. On the other hand, they're selling off their families. They're making a lot of money. The Jewish agency coordinates this land uh, purchase. And you know there's, the Arabs try to say, you're a traitor if you sell your land. Well, they're doing it anyway. You get anti-Zionist riots in 1920, 1929. And from 36 to 39, there is really a civil war going on. For the first time, the Zionists stop depending on the British for defense. And they uh, organize their own army, what's called the Haganah. Or, and they're, uh, it's interesting, there's a Haganah, there's a, something called the Palmach, which is founded by another political party. There are really political armies as well as uh, nationalists. But you see the differences in organization. As I mentioned, the Arabs are based on these families. They're allowed in their conflicts with those families, people looking for control. The Zionist communities are, are more organized in a modern sense. Uh, so you get large scale immigration and we see it in other countries. That's a difficult issue to deal with. If you think of, think of the United States. Immigration, you know, you could have, or even in the 17th and 18th century against the Indians, it's very difficult to stop this flow of people. But in addition, here in Palestine, we have land sales, which I just said, and then this term appears, quote, the absorptive capacity. How much can the land absorb? And there are various estimates, low estimates, and we've seen that they're wrong, you know, Israel has what something close to somewhere between six and eight million people. I don't know the number exactly right now, but they were talking hundreds of thousands, and today we have millions. But at any rate, after 1936, 
and especially after 39, there are restrictions on Jewish immigration, which make the Zionists increasingly uh, come up with an anti-British policy, even though they were dependent on the British for defense up until 1936 and for support. I'm gonna end this section just to say this, and I'll show these slides again next week on this one. There's the, uh, in, from 22, 1922 to 48, Palestine. Uh, and this is a map of what's suggested in 1937. We'll give the Jewish state this, uh, this stuff here in shading and the Arab state with the stripes and nobody accepts it. And in fact, what some historians say, the Arabs have a new style of negotiating. That is to say, they don't negotiate, they just say no. Uh, Churchill and others in Britain were accustomed to reaching a deal. Uh, the Arabs are not interested in any deal. Uh, they just say no. Uh, and you can call it a new style of negotiating, but what they're saying is, look, we have everything to lose. Why do we negotiate for anything? And we have these riots, we have those different organizations of the community. We have the absorptive capacity, which I just mentioned. And then we have the Arab revolt of 36, 1937, a plan for partition, and that's the map. In 1939, what uh, famous or infamous white paper with a limitation on immigration rejected by both sides. We have the civil war. And then in 1947, look at this, the partition plan comes back. And now we see what is supported by the UN in 47. All this, what color is that, blue maybe? Uh, the, Gal uh, the, uh, the Galilee here, uh, going down along the coast and the whole Sinai, uh, I'm sorry, Negev Desert. The, the, it's, partition, the one area in the partition that is not allocated to what is now Israel is this area right here. This is all uh, now became Northern Israel after 1948. But in the main, this is a state. And this here is the current West Bank, which, uh, you know, the, uh, the right wing now calls Samaria, going back to uh, biblical times. Right here is what's the Gaza Strip or Gaza. I mean, here you can see the geographic definition of what we still see today. And uh, I had the feeling when I put this uh, lecture together that I would not be able to, to finish the business in Israel. And I, but I would like to talk about more about Israel next week before moving on to Egypt. So we have just a few minutes. Uh, we can take comments and questions. Uh, let me stop share. And uh, happy to try to answer things or listen to comments. Uh, either raise your hand, unmute yourself, put it in the chat, however you want to do it. Uh, and this is a, a, a topic that's very, certainly in the Jewish community, it's very controversial. You want to have an argument, you bring up the question of Israel. So do we have anybody? I just wanted to point out, and I put this in the chat as well, that um, 39 was, of course, a real turning point in the Holocaust. Um, that was when uh, Germany invaded Poland, began to carry out its genocidal project in mass numbers. Um, and that's why there was, at that point, tremendous pressure uh, for Jews to be able to go to Palestine or any other place they could go. And that was, uh, I think, one of the reasons the British were so uh, anxious to restrict Jewish immigration because they didn't want to be overwhelmed by waves of refugees. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about more next week. We'll, we'll say some more about that. But that's uh, certainly agree with everything the Chava has said. Anybody else? Uh, I'm surprised, we'll see. As I say, uh, this is often uh, a topic that gives you a good deal of arguments. I'll, I'll, I'll say some things next week, which will 
uh, upset some people about this and so we can talk about it more. But if that's it, thank you for coming. Uh, I appreciate your attention and uh, we'll continue this survey of the Middle East. I mean, this is really superficial, but I hope to give you some ideas and how everything we talked about is still in the paper every day from 1922 to 2021, and we still have those issues. So thank you for attending. Thank, thank you, Larry. Complicated. Thank you. Thank you.